Welcome everybody to the Discard of Compass. I'm John Lynch and I'll be hosting another great interview with whoever then the Tim Freak, Mr. Tim Freak, the pioneering philosopher whose best-selling books, inspirational talks and life-changing events have touched the hearts and, friend and minds of hundreds of thousands of people worldwide. And also he's the winner of the MBS Writer of the Year Award 2020 and also the 100 most spiritually influ influential living people on the 2020 list. That's quite, uh, that's quite inspiring, actually. And we're going to talk, I hope, about individualism, a deeper way of living and, uh, and things like that. And Tim has a website, just in case I do forget later on. It's called www.timfreak.com. Tim, welcome. How are you, sir? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. I'm delighted to be here talking to you, John. You're not the run-of-the-mill non-duality speaker, really, are you, I don't think. And I mentioned before, you're like the Richard Branson of spirituality, aren't you? Like, can you talk it's, a bit about that? It's your... a whole new epithet for me, that that is. The, I, I'm, I don't know quite what to make of it, but um, yeah, okay. Um, I'm certainly not, I don't even know really if I am a non-dual teacher or, I, I mean, I certainly be, was seen as that and was part of, the massive explosion of non-duality that happened like 20, 25 years ago. And I was very, very influenced at, at, around that time and before that time by non-duality. Uh, it seemed to really help me understand the experiences I was having and open up new spiritual experiences. Very influenced by figures like, uh, well, the, the person I, I, I'm, that was influential that I met was Ramesh Balsakar in, in uh, Mumbai. Um, and you know, there was a tiny little meeting in his front room with us, about six people. And, uh, and I, I ended up with him because I've been very, very influenced by Srinivas Gadatta Maharaj. Um, so those were my big influences, uh, but probably, but I've moved a long way away from them now. Um, grateful of course, for what they opened up, but I, I think I don't see my own journey, spiritual journey or, the nature of reality in non-dual terms or not what most people mean by that. That's nearly an awakening out of non-duality. I mean, can we touch a bit though on your, on your spiritual experience when you were 12? Am I right there? Yeah. So it started very young for me, John. Um, it, 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 the, um, what I remember and what I wrote about at the time was just being on the hill in my little town in the Southwest of England really sitting with the mystery of it all, which was very strong for me when I was a kid, uh, still is, and something happening. And I didn't know what it was. I was 12, so I had no idea what it was, I, but it massively changed me. And the biggest part of it was the, the feeling like the whole universe was pulsating with love. That was the biggest part of the experience. Deep sense I can see of communion was going on, but I probably I didn't know that word. I don't suspect, so I wouldn't have thought in those terms. And it was very sensorily alive. You know, the whole the, the green was of the grass was very green, and the sky this blue was very blue. All of that sort of thing. And um, so it was quite embodied. Um, and the only uh, way of conceiving the experience that I had to hand was, oh, this is what they mean when they say God is love. Um, which I'd come across uh, as going to church and from my parents, actually from my father, who was an atheist, but um, he liked that line, even though he was an atheist. And uh, so that's the framework that I saw it within. And that set me off then for what has been one way or another, uh, a foundation for the whole of my life, which is like, what the hell happened? How can I experience it again? How can I go deeper into it? And because of my nature, how can I share it with others? And I've been very lucky to be do, able to do all of that. Yeah, and you're a very inspirational character, Tim. I've followed you for a while as well, and I've watched, you know, your your story unfold as such. And, you know, you're not the run-of-the-mill teacher. I don't know, do, do you describe yourself as a teacher, probably? Um, Honest to goodness, John, I started calling myself a philosopher. Philosopher, Just yeah. because okay. I was never, and I don't even know, you know, am I a philosopher? I, you know, I don't work in a academy department or, you know, I... It, a philosopher in the, in the old fashioned sense, the true philosophia, I mean, love, wisdom. It's a lover of wisdom. Pythagoras, who was a very spiritual character, um, according to legend, um, invented the term. So it appeals to me. But the reason that I did it, if I'm completely honest, was to just avoid being called a spiritual teacher because 
at that time, especially when I was younger, it came with a whole lot of baggage mm. that somehow you were setting yourself up as something. You seemed very distant. You had to be this sort of, were you enlightened? Were you fully enlightened? <laughs> All of that sort of stuff. <laughs> All of which um, I wanted to avoid. Uh, so, yeah, so I've avoided, but of course, in effect, I am a spiritual teacher because I teach and I teach about spirituality. But as long as it's seen in that way that you might be a maths teacher because you know about maths and I'm a spiritual teacher because I've spent my life exploring spirituality, then I'm happy with it. But having said that, Tim, you, you have a lot of insights into into a, a broad spectrum of, of the spiritual search, the spiritual um mechanics of things. I mean, you mentioned this Sri Nisargadatta Maharaj, you know, I'm a fan of his as well. And Ramesh, um, they're sort of from the same stable, you know, um, yeah. hard hitting self inquiry, you could say, um, which, which I'm a lover of in, in some mm. respects, uh, there's some compassion in that, I think. Mm. And meeting, meeting Ramesh, um, what was that like? Uh, what propelled you to, to go to him as well? <laughs> I, um, I'd been, I'd come across Nizagadatta, this is the background to that, um, in at the back of a book called Who Dies by Stephen Levine, who was a kind of protege of Ramdas. And Ramdas had had a big influence on me, and, and I, I, I became, became a kind of, I met him quite a few times. Um, I even, when I, I was a musician before I was a writer, and I made a, a dance track with Ram Dass's voice. So I had a connection with Ram Dass. That led me to Stephen Levine. Stephen Levine at the back had this e excerp from, from I Am That, the, what is now the famous book. I'd never heard of it. I'd never heard of him. I read it, blew my mind. I thought, I've got to get this book. Couldn't get the book. I mean, there was no Amazon in those days. And uh, no bookstores had the book. And so I had to send away to India. I traced it down to an Indian publisher and got these Indian books through, read it, blew my mind and bought a copy for all of my friends because it was a level of clarity that I just hadn't come across. And it was addressing this deep experience of, of uh, no self, of oneness, which was opening up for me. Um, but he was dead and that was that. And uh, I had a girlfriend at the time who was into science Baba, uh, which I wasn't really. Um, I'd been into a guru when I was much, much younger and I was gurued out. It just felt like, no, it's, I, I, I just don't want another guru cult. Um, but she wanted to go and see Sai Baba. My parents wanted a trip to India. And so the four of us went to Sai Baba's ashram and I absolutely hated it. Uh, for all sorts of reasons, really, I can share with you if you want, but it's like, it was a, it was just, <sighs> my girlfriend got ill. She'd been ill when she went, visited the ashram before and seriously ill. And I was very worried. Um, but because of this crazy rule thing they have, you know, about being men and women, I couldn't get her any treatment, uh, even though they had this huge hospital, which had been built with the money given to Sai Baba by the guy who did the, the hard rock cafes. But eventually I got her in there. And while she was being treated finally by a Western doctor and I was relieved, there was an American just sitting in the room waiting for somebody as well. And he was reading a book and it was one of those things you, I don't ever had it where I'm just looking at this guy. I'm, I'm polite, I'm English, you know, I don't, you know, I'm, don't bother people. But his book was just going, boo, 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 boo. <laughs> it was just like, what the hell is that? Um, and I don't know what, it was just a book. And I just came and said, excuse me, to, sorry to bother you. I know you're reading, but you know, what's that book? And his the words that came out of his mouth was, have you ever heard of Sri Nizagadatta Maharaj? And I went, yeah, <laughs> I have. And he said, oh, well, this is one of his students called Ramesh Balsakar. He teaches every morning in, Bom in Mumbai. You should go see him. And uh, so I just went back to my parents, God bless them, um, and my girlfriend, and we said, we've got to leave now and go and see this guy. We had two days left in India. And uh, I, I just flew straight to Mumbai and spent two days with Ramesh. And... Yeah, blew me away. Took me took me to the non dual experience, almost straight away, and um, he had a clarity of expressing it. I mean, I now think he was wrong about a lot of things, but at the time it was really insightful for me. And 
enabled me to get things in a in a challenging way. And then I had a really sweet little thing, John, which is just a little th- about the way the, the universe works, the magic of the universe. I think actually, I mean, the whole journey there was like that, it was that I had just had my very first book published, which was a big deal when your first book is published. And it was a version of the Tao Te Ching by Lao Tzu, which had been a very influential book on me, also on Ramesh. And I'm, it's just been published, but I'd never seen it in a shop ever, ever, ever. You know, it's like, you know, it was a small publishing thing, really. I mean, it did okay, but you know, I'd never seen it in a shop or anything like that. And then there I am with Ramesh and I'm thinking, wow, this is like being with Lao Tzu. <laughs> that's the thought that's going through my head. It's like, wow, this is like being with a living Lao Tzu. This is, this is what Lao Tzu was trying to say, I think, you know, all of that. And we left and I came out of the, the first session with him in a complete transported days. Like what the hell just happened to me? And it was really hot. Mumbai, Mumbai, Mumbai was so hot. And I just saw this great big shop and air conditioning was coming out of it. I could feel it. And I just said to my girlfriend, let's just go in there to cool down. And I could just walk through and it was a bookshop huge book shop just walked straight through and they're right in front of me <laughs> right in front of the entrance there was my book <laughs> wow. there was my Tao Te Ching <laughs> <laughs> I was like oh okay <laughs> so that's the universe that aligning for you as you you, you yeah. talk about that actually how, how things align for you you know and and how I'm sitting here talking to you it was inevitable this had to happen maybe um, I don't. I don't think it's inevitable. I don't no. think things have to happen. No. That would be very much Ramesh's idea. Yeah. He was definitely like that. Yeah, he thought it all. You know, it was all planned out and or well, not planned, but it's all going to happen, and you got no choice. And that's Ordained. It. Yeah, no, there's no doers and all of that. I don't think that. I certainly don't think that now. I, I, I think that's actually. I actually think it's a horrible idea, a ghastly idea. And it, it demeans our humanity completely. And so I think there's a dark side to non-duality. And mm. I think that's the essence of the dark side, that it takes away our humanity. Um, because, you know, like you, I'm looking at the thing, never, never, never give up. You've got on the, on your on your th- behind you. That's a lovely sentiment. And but it's it so no not non-dual, is it? It's so not no, non-dual. Yeah. It, it, it makes no damn difference <laughs> what you do, because you can't, you know, even whether you decide to give up or not is not really your free choice, because there's no you. And, and Ramesh's thing was totally, there is no doer. Mm. Now, that can take you to a very deep place of witnessing, which is a very interesting place to go. But it doesn't mean there's no doer. It just means that you're in a deep place of witnessing. And those two can easily get confused. And so I, I passionately, passionately feel now that the individual is not the problem to be overcome. The individual is actually the foundation through which we wake up and that that our experience of, of making choices is fundamental to what we are. And there is something, as I said, almost dark about the the idea that, that we're trying to take that away. I really remember um, running an event with my dear friend Peter Gandhi after we wrote our, our, our bestseller, The Jesus Mysteries, and was still kind of around that non-dual thing and, and doing some of that teaching some of these ideas and a woman leading a meditation and a woman just shouting suddenly just in the middle of the meditation you're trying to kill my soul and it's like wow what just happened and i look back now and i think oh yeah that's exactly what we were trying to do that's what we were trying to do we were telling her that her individual her individuality her psyche her soul whatever you call it was a problem and she needed to get rid of it and there was an illusion or it was a impediment and I, I strongly feel that is mistaken now. I think that's a, a huge mistake. And it's, it's the source of why I think non, that non-dual philosophy, whilst it was great to go through, is ultimately, the word, I, the word I want to use is superficial. And I want to use that word because it sees itself as the deep thing. I did, oh, that's how I was anyway. When I was into non-duality, it was like, this is the real thing. This is the, this is the deep stuff for the people who really get it. And those people that are off into the psychological stuff, that's kind of beginner stuff, but this is it. And there's something, there's, there's definitely a big experience there, but I actually think it's superficial um, because it can't see, it can't see beyond itself. I don't know. I'll be honest. I, I don't disagree with you at all. Um, and I think it's great to bring these things up because, you know, we should, we should, we should look at everything. 
we should look at every aspect of everything. I think, well, I should anyway, I don't want to speak for everybody else, but I think it's a healthy thing that we look at all different aspects yeah. of spiritual searching. I mean, gurus are being exposed for what they are. I mean, lately there, there are horror stories about that. There are films made about, about false well, gurus. It happened, it happened for Ramesh in Germany. Did it really? Um, yeah, but know. you know, but hey, it was just, it was all just happening. Yeah. So there's no moral responsibility because there's no choice involved. It's all just happening. Yeah. So, um, um, so that, that doesn't feel right to me. No, like I find this interesting because personally it resonates with me, with what you're saying. Um, I had, you know, you could say experiences, but this isn't about me, you know. Um, mm. And, but the whole thing did a, a 180 and I went from spiritual seeking to totally into some in totally into business, heavy into mm -hmm. business, into creativity, into different aspects of, of being ambitious, maybe in some way with different projects. And I, to be honest, Tim, I, I can't even stop that now. Um, <laughs> these two things aren't supposed to mix ambition, individualism, uh, and spirituality. Well, you know, they don't really mix. And if they do, people hijack them and make religions out of them. So, What's your take on that? Well, I had the same thing. I mean, you know, my, my youth, because I woke up early, um, I was a constant battle going on between the part of me that, that wanted to be, especially be creative and the part that was going, that's just an ego trip. Stop doing that. You know, and if you were a first class seeker, you become a monk, Tim, which I almost did twice. And thank God I didn't. I ended up having a family and all the rest of it. And I'm delighted that that was the path for me. So look, for me now, it feels like, just I just root it in one simple philosophical idea and then which is reality is not non-dual it's what I the word the better word I think is unidual it's all one but it's a universe it's a universe it's one thing reality is one thing and but there's more to say and the phrase which really works for me is it, this is the one in relationship with itself. And everything is the one in relationship to itself. So that's what you and I are. We are we're the universe having evolved into this place where we're conscious, where we can think in symbolic language. And so we're the universe going, what the hell am I? And having a conversation about it. <laughs> and that's pretty damn interesting. <laughs> yeah. And, and we're doing that because we're individuals. And the more we think for ourselves and go through the process of being ourselves, the more individual we become, the more, the more conscious we become. And so that then the shift for me is this, we mentioned at the beginning, individualism, which is the idea that we can evolve into what I call individuals, which is individuals conscious of unity, not the removal of the individual. Because I don't think 14 billion years of evolution to get us to this conversation as a mistake. And if we could just see through the fact that there is no Tim and no John, we'd all be okay. It feels like, look, the mistake is that we think we're separate, just, and we never have been. I've never had a moment in the whole of my life where it was just me. It's always been me and the universe. Always. There's always been a relationship going on between me and, 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 the, and everything else. So who am I? I'm that relationship. <laughs> I'm guessing it's the same for you. You're that relationship. So the jump is when you go, oh, look, I'm the whole thing as this meeting the whole thing. And if you go into that very deeply, that's when the experiences, I call them deep awake experiences like I had when I was a kid. And there's this oneness and the oneness feels like love because love is how oneness feels. That's, you know, that connectedness, which is why I think when I was on the top of that little hill, the universe was full of love. And people have been exploring these states forever. But the mistake that gets made in spirituality is that is the idea that there is that it was all worked out whenever 2000 years ago 2500 years ago in the case of india or whenever it is and that's it whereas actually our understanding needs to keep evolving and so non duality was a big jump forward for me personally and then i had to go beyond it but also for the whole culture human the evolution of the human psyche and it's really, but it's been, you know, like most of the, the philosophies that came through at that time is it is about two and a half thousand years ago. And we know more now. 
So we need to keep it moving. And, and that's why I think it's time to, to dump those, um, those ideas and develop new ones. But the experience is, um, and, the, and actually the experience gets richer, I think. There it's can a, be something which you see in non-dual groups. Don't you think that people get very detached and can get very cold? Whereas when you come through the individual, that's when you get the love and the connection and it's very embodied. It's, it's a beautiful thing. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. And it's slippery path. People have to have some sort of spiritual integrity comes into my mind again. And it's it's often come up. It came up on another podcast as well. It's about integrity, isn't it, in some way? I, I, I really, that's that's my thing about being, you know, avoiding spiritual teacher. It feels like what I really want and is to do what we're doing now. I want to co- communicate with other human beings who are really interested in this, like I am. And I want to try and be Tim. And Tim's a work in progress. And he's expanding and he, you know, and if you spent... 24 seven with him. Like I do, you'd see all sorts of size to Tim. You'd go, Whoa, really? <laughs> you know, cause that's what it's like being a human being. And also I hope in my 60 something years, there's some wisdom. And I, and, and, and like most people, you get to know what you focus on. Well, I focused on this. So I know quite a bit about this and I can share it and I can take people to the experience. That's the great, greatest thing, John, is I can take people to the experience uh, or I can help them see it for themselves or whatever you, however you want to see that. So what, what's the path you teach or, or suggest, philosophize about uh, to be a new uni, individual? Un, individual. Yeah. Um, well, it's all pretty new. It's all developing. It, it, it's building on my last, last book, Soul Story, which is a philosophy book, which is really an attempt to bring science and spirituality together because I think culturally we need to do that. Um, and I think there's a way we can do that with the this new understanding of evolution, which I think is a huge thought that the whole universe has evolved. And it really does look that way. I mean, so you've got, a, that's a really interesting take on the one in relationship to itself, evolving over 14 billion years to get us through from you know, hydrogen to us having this conversation. That's, that's pretty interesting. And, and from matter to life and then to this psyche, this non-material symbolic realm of narrative that we're sharing ideas in right now that, that isn't anywhere <laughs> it's like it's transmaterial i mean this is this is pretty interesting so i'm interested in articulating a new mythos really which can do that and then in terms of the actual awakening of getting the oneness um i i'm trying also covid has got in the way but i hope to get back to also doing more events with people i do them online because the most powerful way that I found, I mean, I, I, I teach various forms of meditation because that's meditation is just about focusing. So if you, ch- if you put your focus on the oneness of everything, that becomes much more obvious. And so you can learn to do that. Uh, but the biggest thing I found is connection. So I will get people to meditate on each other and connect with each other in a very profound way. Well, like now, you know, it's like I can look at your picture on the screen and you're not even with me physically, but I can look on your picture on the screen and I can just say, oh yeah, that's a, that's, that's John's face. That's very nice. Or I can go, wow, that's a human being's face. That's amazing, actually. And John's alive. And then I can go another level and go, but what I'm actually connecting with is John's psyche, John's soul. I can't see it. So something that you can't see is connecting with something I can't see right now. That's where we're, we're passing information between us and you make that conscious. And that's a very, that's another whole another level of connection. And then if you want to deepen that out, you can just, you can actually then get to the place we almost played with earlier where you go, how about we're the one connecting with itself? How about that? What's that like? And you can get that. And then suddenly there's the individual. You're an individual as the one connecting with itself. And if you do that in the right way and you do it for uh, long enough, that's where this big love just explodes. And there's a place of undefendedness, but that's there, yeah. isn't it? It's undefended. Yeah. It's quite interesting. Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful way of putting it. Yeah, that's right. There is. 
There's, and, and, and you need to have an, a real safety for that. And, and it generates safety. I think that, I think the deep wake state generally leads to a great, well, the old fashioned word is faith, pistis in the Greek, which has got a terrible reputation because it's got tied into the idea of believing in crazy dogmas. But really it's about confidence, confidere, with faith in life. You know, that it's okay, that there's something significant here. And there's something on your side, even though it doesn't mean that there won't be awful suffering and bad things can happen, of course, but that, un- that through all of that, there's something good. Yeah. And I have immense confidence in that. It's it's like a support. It's like here what comes up for me is like potentiality. You're supported by life, which, which isn't really correct. But, you know, we're, we have to use words here. You are life, but, you know, there's an individual. Um, but ultimately, we are that power, aren't we, Tim? You know, that undefined power. Um, that's quite exhilarating to live by that. And, you know, it's quite creative. It It's quite accommodating. There's lots of things about living like that. And I totally get what you're saying. I, I think this is missed a lot. And I think it's a missed opportunity somehow for people to live by why not live that way i say what do you think i i i I, the the best times is when that is strong for me and uh, there's a kind of a dance with life which i love um which can open out and i think that what was so great for me and why i feel immensely lucky one of the many reasons i feel very lucky with having that experience when i was 12 and then onwards, is that it made me realise that life wasn't given or, or, or the experience of living wasn't a given. It wasn't like, this is the experience of living. It's like, this is the experience of living in this state of consciousness. This is the experience of living in this state of consciousness. Oh, <laughs> this is a state of living in this state of consciousness. So, and so it became very clear that I wasn't just going to see what life is because what I saw life to be would depend on what state my psyche was in. And so it was, a, it was a, it, it, again, it's a relationship. It wasn't like there's life, I just observe it. It was like, I'm interacting with it all the time. I'm in relationship with it. So what I perceive it to be also depends on me, not just on it. And the whole, the, the spiritual seeking, I think for more, you know, my, my, my guess is, look, if this has been 14 billion years of evolution to lead to psyche, what spirituality is really doing is exploring the most emergent or most evolved states. That's what it's doing. That's why when you hit the states, you go, wow, this is incredible. Because whenever you hit something more, it feels incredible because it's more real. It's more, it's the, it's the cutting edge of this huge process we're in. So I think spirituality has always been, about exploring those states. It hasn't necessarily understood what it was doing in that way, of course, but I think that's what it's done. So this, so touching the oneness of everything or the non-duality of everything is a very emergent state. It's wonderful. It's only with the philosophy kicks in and then goes, yes, but that's, and this shows you that you don't exist or th- that you have to leave the body behind or the self behind or all the ideas that not everyone in non-duality has, but have been around spirituality for centuries. When they kick in, then it becomes, you lose your connection with the world. But that doesn't have to happen. You can, you can have a non-dual experience by, by simply concentrating on the oneness or the non-dual or the formless. And you can become completely immersed in it so that you don't feel you exist as an individual. You do. You're just not concentrated on it. It's a bit like when you sleep at night and you go into, a, say, a dream, a very different experience. But you've got no consciousness that you're lying on a bed, but you are. It's just your attention is completely in the dream. And the same with these deep states of meditation or immersion, samadhis. You just go right into it and it's fantastic. And you can and then you come back. Now, if your if your philosophy is, oh, I'm back and I've fallen into the illusion of separateness again, otherwise I'd be there the whole time, then your separateness is now a problem. But if your philosophy is, I was able to go there because of this individual that I could experience the oneness th- so that through the someone, the one can experience the one, then it's a, a it's, you're, you live it, you live it out in a completely different way. 
Yeah, it it's like a re, it's like a reborn, isn't it? Yeah, it's it's, 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 it's exactly like that. Yeah, uh, you know, reborn, resurrected, return from the dead, all those uh, you know old old mythic memes that they they describe what happens that there's there's an experience that that changes everything and we as human beings are i i think i mean i i don't have i haven't you know i don't have the data to back this up or anything like that it's purely anecdotal but i think we are heading towards these states i think that's where evolution is going next i think we're evolved we've evolved into individuals collectively on a level never seen before in history we're, we're, we've individualized to an extraordinary extent. We've come out of our groups, come out of our cultures. We're not divided just into men and women. You can be, you know, you 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 are yourself. You're an individual now. There's a long way to go, but we. It's unprecedented in history. So that's happened, or is happening, and my observation is: I think we're opening out into oneness, so that that as we become more individual, we're also caring more about humanity as a whole rather than just our tribe. That's a huge change, not happened before in history. A lot of people care about humanity as a whole. They don't know, we don't realize what a big shift that is. We care about nature, whereas previously nature would be something that would just kill us, a danger, something to avoid. We care about it. We feel connected to it. We care about animals that are going to be extinct that could rip us to shreds. This is all new stuff. And it's a sign of that expansion of unity. And then, you know, when I started stepping out to go, okay, I want to see if I can introduce people to the oneness. First of all, I had no idea how to do it. Secondly, I didn't rate my chances because it just seemed to happen when it happened to me. And, you know, who was I? But what I've seen is over the last 20, 30 years, more and more people, and I go, there's an experience of oneness, go, oh, yeah, I've experienced that. Or I'd like to experience that. Or I feel I've been close to it. Or Whereas before, it's like, that's just an abstract, weird thing to say. What do you mean, experience the oneness? I don't even know what that means. That would be the reaction I was getting previously. So I think I think we are evolving from individuals into individuals. I think. And even the I story hope. or the picture you're painting even speaks of individualism. Yeah, um, that's exactly what it is. It it's does, that. yeah. And uh, I like the way you said that we're all individuals and it's like I'm non-dual and so is everybody else. It's kind of, kind of like, you know. <laughs> 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 so, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's um, but it's uh, what's coming up for me, Tim. Is it's slippery? It's a slippery slope as well for some people. Still, um, there's a lot of suffering, and to get people introduced to non-duality is very difficult because the ego does does not want to look at this because it's the end of the apparent ego. You know, you could say. Uh, uh, yeah, I don't think any of that's true, John. No. So if you ta- if you take somebody and you go, this your ego is going to fight this because it means the death of your ego. Go what is your ego going to do? It's going to go no. <laughs> if, if you go to it, if you can evolve yourself into a strong, healthy ego, you can have the most amazing experience of oneness, and it will feel like a completion of what you are because you'll realize that you are the whole thing. What does the ego say then? He goes, great, let's do it. Wow, that's that's a different way of looking at us. Um, yeah, it is. And and so we're creating all of these civil wars inside ourselves for no reason. Now, look, if you say to anyone, and this is where spiritual cults come from, you know, India, where all of this is really based, has historically been a very materially backward country for quite some time, full of religious cults. If you want to set up a religious cult, this is the best philosophy you could possibly lay your hands on. Some people have just got it. They have the understanding. They have the experience. They can, their authorities. Okay, so now that's part of a cult. If you think it's a problem, thinking is a problem. Stop thinking. Don't doubt, have, you know, believe in the master, all of that. That's, so that's, that's cultish. And there's a thing in you 
which wants to stop you getting this enlightenment, which the other, the master's got. And you need someone outside of you who could confront you because you will never do it yourself. And it will try everything to stop you. Well, this is, this is disastrous philosophy, horrible, horrible, disastrous, negative philosophy, and will lead to all sorts of disassociation and breakdown and all those, all of which will be used to endorse the fact that what you're doing is such a, must be true because it's such a struggle. At the bottom of it, you know, for me now, from an evolutionary perspective, it's like, what are you saying? We've 14 billion years to arrive at an individual as, and really it's been a huge mistake. And if only we could get back to it all being one. It's like, that doesn't make any sense. Or if you've got kids, you know, it's like, what are you going to say to your kids? Don't develop into an individual. Stop thinking. What? <laughs> it's like, you know, <laughs> that, that can't be it. So I, I see it as a nexus. I feel like well, for many of us in my generation, we, we didn't find what we were looking for in Christianity, although I went back and did find it in Christianity, actually, years later. And so we looked east but we've been very critical of the superficiality of Western religion. And now it's time to, to have the same critique of Eastern religion. And it's also, it's just old. That's all it is. It's good for its time. And now we need to move on. I'm trying to unpack it out of my head. What, what you said. Sure, um, sure. One thing is coming up for me is a bit, so I don't know why it's, it's coming up, but it's, um, then you mentioned the psyche there's something that, thanks be to whatever, change can happen, yeah? Which is a yeah. wonderful thing. It's a potentiality that's there. And only yeah. for that change, nothing could, apparently, nothing could could go on, apparently yeah. happen. I, I just think that's just a wonderful thing. And it's a mystery to me. Um, and the thing about it is, we there's a psyche and there seems to be some sort of choice that we can choose what direction we take. And you mentioned evolution, and what come up for me was the fact that along the lines somewhere, psyches changed, and therefore genes changed. And I, I wonder, can our psyche change our genetic structure anyway? Is that what happens? Is as we, I, you know, progress? I don't know that. I don't. I don't know if that's possible. If that happens, I mean, the 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 higher levels of emergence do have powerful effects on the lower ones, and. And the mind or the psyche has a massive effect on the body. There's no doubt about that. Look, I'm going to, I'm going to use my psyche right now to lift this arm. Watch. I did that with my psyche. Isn't that amazing? Look, I just moved all that matter up in the air. It's like, it's a very powerful thing, the psyche. So who knows what it can do? Mm. I, my sense is that the genes are a form of connecting to the past of the biological level. And we have the same equivalent with the psychological level, the psyche the, or the trans material level and you're right it's like that's that's where the evolution is happening now. in my my our, our physical bodies aren't evolving fast they evolve very slow and mainly through life and death life and death we evolve as species but as psyches we evolve as individuals and it, we're evolving right now it's happening as we speak we're sharing ideas we're evolving so in individual psyches and in cultures which is collections of individual psyches the evolution is exponential. And that's why I think the individual jump can happen. Uh, I, I'm not predicting it's going to not a profit or anything. I'm not going to say it's going to happen in my lifetime, although maybe, I don't know, probably not. But I think it can happen because we, it, we can evolve so quickly as psyches. So it's really, besides dismissing, the, what, what I'm kind of seeing, besides dismissing the individual and the psyche and where we are and going down the non-dual route and apparently blackening the the individual it's the opposite we should be going to the other direction and looking at the individual hitting on enlightenment that way i think so i think the individual has has evolved and now through the individual the individual is what has the experience and you have this ability to focus attention which is a very emergent thing to be on what you focus attention on you're conscious of and what you don't put attention on you're not conscious of. So that's a very precious thing. What do you put that attention on? Well, if you learn to put your attention on to what I would call the oneness of being, the fact that everything has this one quality in common, it exists. There's one field of being 
which is arising as everything. That's the point where you can you can step into these deep awake or enlightenment, if you like, you know, that word, if that's the word, you know, you can step into this state of, of oneness and you can do it with the forms or you can do it just straight into the field itself, which is, which is actually formless, which is the samadhi states. But it's interesting because that's how traditional enlightenment happens anyway with a focus. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. It's exactly what ha- happens. And, and, and it is changing. I mean, I'm, I'm being very critical of non-duality, but you know, I witnessed non-duality change when I first, did uh, went to the science and non-duality mm. uh, conferences. Spoke the first time in a, it was in America somewhere in California. Sorry, uh, it, it, I was the you know absolutely the heretic because I was kind of a both and person, not either oneness or separateness, but both oneness and separateness. They, they coexist. It's that's the way it is. Um, and, and that, and, and it was really like very, the whole hardline thing was like, no, you know, you haven't got it at all. This is it. Um, but over the years that changed profoundly for a while, it was really funny because for a while it felt like the whole audience, all the people attending, they all got it. <laughs> but the teachers, they did, they were all the ones going, no, 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 it's this, it's this. And the audience, went, I'm not sure about that. Actually. And then gradually the, the, the teachers, I think have also changed or some of them, not all of them. So you know, more recently, I haven't been for that for that recently because of COVID, but recently it's not been like that. And numbers of them have made that journey. Um, and I made that journey. You know, I, I, I was, after I met Ramesh, I I felt like, oh no, this is it. This is the, you know, the the, the, the no self and it's all just happening. And, and it was, it opened up an inter- interesting experience. And I know why people get into it because they're having that experience. Um, it just doesn't stop there. And, and, then I, I just, I, well, there's a, there's a, a very old um, tradition in Zen, the 10 bulls. Do you know the 10 bulls, John? It's Vaguely a, remember it's, it, but I forget. It's, it's, it's a, it's a, there's a teaching which go, a, revolves around these 10 pictures and it takes you through the mastery of the self, which is the bull and a little character and you master the bull. And where it leads to is the eighth, which they're all in Zen circles, little pictures in Zen circles. It leads to the eighth where, the bull disappears, and so do you, and it's just empty. And what's interesting, and that's the non-dual thing. It's like you've mastered the self, and then the self disappears, and you're just in the non-dual. And originally, the story ended on number eight, the octave. And then later, they added nine and ten. And in nine and ten, you come back to the marketplace. You come back down the mountain to the marketplace, and you're, and you're in this both-and state what I call the individual. And there's this lovely picture of the, the old master with his stick and a bottle of wine walking through the marketplace. And it just felt like, yeah, that's one. That's the one. <laughs> that sounds, that feels right. And that's kind so it's been, people have been, you know, I'm, I'm certainly nowhere near the first. That was probably a thousand years ago. Um, so it, these things have been explored by other people and other traditions as well as the more extreme version that became popular over here. Um, you, you mentioned focus. Can you describe the focusing of the psyche, how, how the conscious focusing happens? Would you have an insight to that? Yeah, I mean, the meditation which I have been playing with, uh, I just call it um, entering and opening, where you, you really get to see what the attention is. I mean, often I'll do something, you know, just kind of crazy just to get, the, to get it and go, look, be conscious of your left foot. It's like you weren't conscious of it a moment before, and then you are. It's like what moves there? Mm. that's the attention and what and whatever you focus on it like it comes into hd and whatever you're not focused on just disappears and it's not in your attention whether you, and and that's in true to of thoughts it's true of sensation and everything so what i will do to, is, is to say okay so so the, a great first step is to take your attention and really focus on something a sensation for instance is really good that's why the breath is good because it's always there. Listening is also very good. Just focus right. But then, but and and then, without it being a big deal, don't let yourself get too distracted. And this is where the mind is a problem comes from. It comes from where well, you can't think about you can't put attention to the thinking and attention to your breath at the same time. So it's not a problem. It just means make a choice. And if you're if you keep moving between them, just choose. The, and then what will happen? Or this is what happens for me. 
is that whatever you focus on just goes, wow. So when I was in my 20s and really discovered this during long periods of meditation, I thought, because I was being taught by Buddhists and all the rest of it, that I was being told to focus on my breath because it was so boring that I'd be enlightened eventually. I'd probably say lifetimes, but it would just be so boring that I would just give up and I'd, then I'd be in this great place. What actually happened was I discovered that just to breathe is fantastic, <laughs> feels amazing, <laughs> and fills you with something. And, and so if you focus on that or listen there, you can really focus in and just see, oh, when I focus on it, it comes into HD. It's like if you've ever done magic mushrooms or, or anything like that, and you, you just find yourself just looking at some crease in your hand, and it's like, wow, have you seen this? <laughs> and just that focus where something is like a miracle, and it's the silliest little thing. You can do that with your attention. And when you get that, that's the entering, entering in. It comes actually from a Zen story, that, the idea of entering, because there's, a, there's a, one an old Zen story that I always remember in which a, uh, a, uh, is a master and pupil, as there always is in Zen stories, and the pupil says to the master, how can I be enlightened, as they always do? And the master says and something very interesting. He just says, can you hear that babbling brook? He says, yeah. Says, Enter there. And that's where I got it from years and years and years and years and years ago. It's like, oh, partly because there's a babbling brook outside my house where I was meditating. So I just go there and enter there. Just like, so that's the entering. And then when you've got that, which is really about focusing on something very, very specific and holding your attention there until it comes, really comes alive. Then you can take your attention and do the opposite and just open it out like, so it's not on anything specific. It's on the oneness of everything. You're taking in the oneness of the existence of the whole universe. Um, and if you sit with that, with that same level of staying with it, uh, you, that's when the, the, the oneness experience can just become, be, in the same way as that little particular can become HD, as it were. So that becomes really, really obvious. And the more you focus on it, you can let go of, temporarily, you can let go of being Tim in the room or anything, just like all of that can go. And it's just this huge oneness and sit with that for a bit. <clears throat> that was quite profound there, actually. Um, it was really interesting how you'd go in and you'd focus and then you'd expand the focusing. I could actually feel it. It was, it was, it was lovely, yeah, yeah. When it comes to ambitions, Tim, um, and never shall money and spirituality meet, I mean, they actually do, in traditional <laughs> spirituality, they meet quite often. Um, and, you know, spirituality and non-duality, you look, a lot of it, is, I see a lot of businesses in it. And I've I've seen gurus, you know, uh, doing it just for the money, first-hand experience of it. Um, and it's a bit con disconcerting, to be honest. And, but this happens, this is life. But what, what have you to say about that? I mean, you know, ambitions, money, the business of it. And ambition I think in general. Things. I think I think ambition is is fine. I mean, I wish I'd known that when I was twenty, mm. um, because I thought my ambitions were awful and a sign of how egotistical I was, and I should get rid of them and try very very hard to. Mm. Um, actually, I've ended up living them out, but it's been very natural and really good. So I, I think my take would be: look, the universe seems to be the realization of ever more emergent potentials. That seems to be what it is. It's just constantly realizing another potential, new, new, new. And every new one is built on what's gone before. So if that's what's got us from, like I said, hydrogen to thoughts, then we're part of that, you and me. So built into life is its own purpose, which is to realize ever more emergent potentials. So I think it's natural that, that John and Tim will if, if you know if we're really alive, we'll feel that drive to realize more, more be more, to 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 bring more to the party, to to, and that can be more in every direction. 
you know, there'll be things about Tim, which is unique to Tim, or he's a writer and he wants to do that or philosopher. Not everyone wants to do that. Thank God. Um, and you will have your things and your business or whatever it is that you, that's going, Oh, I need to do this. And then there's things which are universal, like, like I think the awakening to our, to oneness, to the individual, that's the same. Um, but we'll do it on our own unique way. I do think that, and what works for me may or may not work for you. You may, you may find that you enter it by doing the can can, you know, it's like you, it'll be something you will be different and the way that you describe it and maybe the way you experience it will not quite be the same because we're not the same. That's the whole point. So I think the ambition thing is like, yeah, great. And I want, you know, if I was dealing with, with a young person, I'd be going, yeah, just follow it. Well, I think actually what I'd say to a young person, honestly, John is follow your, follow your dreams because they probably won't work out, uh, but it won't matter. Because in the attempt, you know, to, to, in the attempt to make them work out, you will form yourself. And that's what really matters. That's the key thing is you form your own soul. And then there's a separate thing, which is, should spirituality be messed up with money? I mean, it's never been really, I mean, I, 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 I have a, I stay alive and I've supported my family and I've never have to, I've never had to face massive money coming in and the moral conundrum of that. Um, and partly it's because it's never been about money for me. Uh, in fact, if anything, I would say I need to have a better attitude towards money um, than I've had because my natural instinct is just to avoid it. But that's kind of a head in the sand kind of thing. I have, because I, I have a family, I've been, I haven't been able to live with my head in the sand, thank goodness. So I've had to get better at it. How do I feel about it when, it, I mean, obviously I think, see, word you said, integrity, if it's done with integrity, and someone can handle it and they're doing it well, I, I think it's okay. If it's not done with integrity, then it's not. I think it's it's probably as simple as that, really. And all I know is that for myself, the place I've always wanted to get to, and I'm closer to getting there now than I've ever been because I'm older, is the place where I can just do it for free. And that's, I've never understood people who get very, very successful, make loads and loads of money and then charge more. I just think, why wouldn't you do it for free? Because when you do it for free, it just feels so good. <laughs> it just, it's like, it's the best feeling in the world when you're doing this, you know, when you just do it. It's like, we're not talking to you for free. It's like, you know, it's like, it's me. I'm just coming to be with you. And there's no strings attached. It's like, I love that. It, I don't understand why the person themselves wouldn't feel like, no, 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 I don't charge anymore. Ugh, I don't have to do that. I'm now in a position where I can just say, have this. Um, and, the more I can do that, the better. And, and, and the project which I'm working on, I hope to, the big philosophy project that I'm working on right now, my, my, my hope is to get it to the place where I can just give it away for free. And what project, Tim? It's on individualism. Just, um, that's it, and yep, it's yep. A, uh, it is a, it's going to be a, um, a audio product, um, kind of a cross between a podcast and a book but it's going to be very much ordered a kind of a, a chapters and sections and all that kind of clarity that I want, but delivered like we're talking now. And it's going to be quite long and it's, it's big and I want to cover a lot of ground. So it won't be for everyone. I don't think, but I, I, I really, it feels like this is the thing I need to do before I die. That's all I know, John. And whether I'll succeed or not, I don't know that, but I know I have to give it a go and get it out there now while I can. And, and, and not that I'm intending to die anytime soon, but but just in case, you know, it's like I want to. This is this feels insignificant, and and my focus up until probably five years ago has been mainly on the experience, sharing the experience with people, and I've done that a lot, and I'm grateful for that, and I'd like to still do that. But since then, it has felt like no, you need to step back now, Tim, and you need to develop a story, a narrative, a, a, a paradigm, or. A, a philo story, I think of it, a way of seeing what this is, which can bring together the culturally dominant ideas that we call science and these old ideas, which are, which we're losing really, which we think of as spirituality and brings out what's good in them and, and can revivify them and create a new, a new paradigm because human being, human culture always moves forward with new paradigms. There will be a new one. There just will. I mean, so we're not done. The question is, what is it and when will it come? And, and I, I'd like to try and make some sort of contribution to that. 
Well, good luck with that. And it sounds fascinating. Yeah, yeah. I, I could actually see it happening. And it's it's quite inventive. And you're you're a visionary, you know. Uh, you're Actually, that's the way I'd see it. Yeah, that's probably, that's probably, I think that is true. I think that's, that is one of the qualities I have. And then it's a matter of, you know, what, what I envisage and whether it's a value to other people. And I love it. You know, I get up literally every day I'm in this little room working on it. And I've no idea why, <laughs> you know, because I, <laughs> I, I know there's a very good chance not, nothing much will come of it. Um, but something in me i've fallen in love with it and it so that when i see what it is it's like no this is beautiful and i need to give people the chance to be able to see it and go nah or oh yeah thank you that's really good and and for it to open up a new um chapter in their lives yeah and hopefully it'll make changes for people as well you know i really hope so you know because at the end of the day the, the big thing for me with the word philosophy is it's not when I talk about philosophy, I, for me, it's not like an abstract intellectual. Rah, 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 rah. It's not like that. It's about changing how you see this. So, it, so when you change your your way of seeing or way of thinking, you're not in the same world anymore. So it's a so I see philosophy as like a kind of magic. It's like a philosophy, you, you, isn't it? <laughs> it's like a what? Sorry, a philosophy. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You just like it. Suddenly you're in a, you're, you can be in a, you can, you're in a different world. And I think the biggest thing that I, I want now, it used to be to introduce people to oneness, still is, but more and more it's about wanting people to see how valuable their lives are and that their individual journey as that particular individual is not some meaningless chance event like science says, or that philosophy of science says, neither is it some illusion they've fallen into like some of the spiritual, but actually it's a really significant thing and they matter and they, they, and, and to grab it while they can and engage with it and make the most of it and never, never, never give up. Yeah. There's like a true relationship in what you're saying as well. You know, you discussed that before. It's like a, there's a meeting, like a, it's a wonderful meeting in, in what you're saying. Yeah. Totally. And so that you're constantly in, you are the, you are always in relationship with the one and, if you see the one purely on the material level, then it's a cold, empty universe. But if you see it on the most emergent level, you're in relationship with God. And and then, you know, when I'm with you, I can be on, I can do the same. I can be just like John, yeah, who's that? Or I can go, oh, well, there's God. Uh, interesting. And yeah. we can connect in that that deeper way. And then there's this love and benevolence. And, yeah. and, and, it's, and living's a completely different experience then. Tim, it's, it's been wonderful uh, talking to you and I can't wait to see where the individualism com comes in and, and where you go with it. And the project sounds really fascinating and interesting. And even there when you're talking about it, I kind of resonated with it uh, and I, I, I felt it, you know, it was, uh, it, it feels good uh, of an idea to well, think about, yeah. I, 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 you know, if anyone, if you or anyone listening to this is interested, the, the best thing would be to sign up for, for my newsletter. Because then, uh, A, because you get these little videos um, that I do and discussing it in advance, they come out and you get all of those. And, and, and B, when it does come out, and I'm hoping it'll come out beginning of next year. I'm hoping. I thought it was going to be ready a year ago, though, John, to be honest. But anyway, I'm still hoping. Um, uh, and then you'll hear. And like I said, I, I'm expecting to, to just make it available. So it'll be there for people. And then if people want to engage, I've started this thing a little while back, a couple of years back, called the International Community of Individuals, or the ICU, because I do this gazing. Um, I thought we'd call it the ICU. And so I've got this community. It's a little online community. It's, it's only small, and it's people all over the world. Just amazing. And we meet up on a Sunday night, and um, we do practices, and we share philosophy, and we ask questions, and we hang out, and we encourage each other to wake up to our individuality. It's very sweet. That's wonderful, Tim. I, I just want to give some people the, where they can hook up with the newsletter and also where they can find the yeah. International Community of Individuals as well. On yeah. your website or what? Or? Yeah, all on the website. And it's not, I mean, my name is an odd name. 
it's pronounced freak, but it's written F R E K E. And as long as you get that right, you'll end up, there's only one Tim freak, thank God. And you'll end up on my website and then it's all, all there and you can contact me as well from there. That's great. Thanks for that. Um, I'd have to pop in sometime and uh, I'm interested in, in having a go. Um, yeah, yeah, do, do yeah. come along, John. And, you know, and we, it's not a subscription service. So it's not like, well, if you pay this much, you get this. And if you pay this much, you get this. And then if you pay this much, you get to be with Tim. None of that. Everyone gets the same. Um, and it, and, and it, you, people are very welcome to come as guests and just hang out and see what they make of it. And then what I ask then, if you, when, once people have decided, no, I'd like to be part of this, is I really think because it's a, because it's about, it's not just about taking, it's about giving. I just say, look, give something, give something. Um, so that you feel like you're giving to this, not just passively taking it. And that's it. And it can be anything. And some people it's very, very small and some people it's much bigger and, and that's fine because it, it's, and, and that also has that quality. You know, when I said earlier, I really want to give this away. It means mm-hmm. I could be there going, look, I'm giving this away. And if you want to give something back, hallelujah. Um, and I like that relationship. Wonderful. Wonderful. Um, and you've got a lot of books there as well. You can buy on Amazon. I have to mention them because you've got a, a load of books. Tim. Yeah, 35, 35 books. books. So the, the two that might be relevant to our conversation is the last two, which is Soul Story, which is the evolutionary philosophy. That's where it started. And then the one before that is Deep Awake. And that's uh, more about the awakening. Although, you know, warning, my ideas are moving on fast. So by the time the new one comes out, there's kind of areas. I'm, I'm spending a lot of time disagreeing with myself at the moment. And thinking I've been wrong about things. So that's that's happening faster than any time in my life. So there are things in my old books that I actually disagree with now. Oh, that's, that's very honest, actually. Yeah, it's quite, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. It, and it's been an honest conversation, Tim, as well, you know. Uh, touched on a lot of things normally people wouldn't want to talk about. And I think it's, it's we need to talk about these things and we need to have a look at every every angle, you know. Yeah, yeah. thanks. Yeah, yeah. I've really enjoyed it. Lovely to meet you. And uh, I don't think you're ever, ever going to give up, are you? <laughs> no, I think that, I don't think so. I think it's too late now. <laughs> Especially before you have your project done. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Mr. Tim Freak, thanks so much for coming on the show. Really enjoyed it. Thank you, sir. My pleasure.